So welcome back to the second day and the second session of uh, Making a Mark, Graphs Beyond Language. Um, just, to get, uh, just to get us uh, started here, I'm going to um, say that today I will, I was just reminded that I will be making marks to the speakers. This mark means that you have five minutes left. You have 20, you've spoken for 25 minutes. This mark means that you're at 30 minutes, and this mark means you've hit 45 minutes and you are cutting into the other speaker's time. So um, those will be our operating, that's our operating code for the purposes of our morning session. I also want everyone to note um, the particular code that I've used for indicating that this is section two. Um, so tally marks, exactly. Roman numerals as well. Um, but before I uh, invite our speakers up to sequentially to, to speak, I thought I might say a couple of things to uh, frame the conversation uh, in this session and to reflect a little bit upon the conversation that we had uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, and, and I want to do that by talking about um, a kind of operated, operative tension that's present uh, whenever we talk about graphs beyond language. And this is the fundamental tension between mark making and language. This is something that Professor Houston already spoke about in his opening comments yesterday, but I think it's quite central to the broader problematic and to what motivates our conversation here today. Um, and one way of thinking about this is through what I'm calling, or what, I, what you might call the specter of the ideograph. And my engagement with thinking about this problem has been informed by a recent article published by Edward McDonald on uh, character fetishization in Chinese studies, which students in our class, this, um, our class that picture text this semester, have uh, been reading and discussing. Um, just a very brief quote from that. Um, uh, from that text. Uh, the notion of ideograph has proved of limited use in understanding how Sumerian cuneiform worked, even less so for Egyptian hieroglyphs, and has been actively misleading in delaying some, for some decades the successful decipherment of Mayan writing. However, in Chinese studies and related fields, this term and the conceptions of Chinese writing lying behind it still have many adherents. Um, and what McDonald is reacting to in this quote, or is what he's responding to, is uh, what he understands is a sort of basic fundamental tension that generates the, um, the through dial a sort of dialectical tension that generates the two disciplines of linguistics and Chinese studies. Um, this is a tension that's familiar to most of you in this room, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, but I also wanted to point out that he's also reacting to not just a tension in the sort of post-enlightenment structure of the disciplines, but also um, a, a tradition that is actually very, very deep coming out of East Asia. And this is the tradition of wanting to find um, meaning that stands independently of the linguistic content of um, linguistic marks, or wanting to see the marks, wanting to see the script as non-linguistic, as not uh, contained by language. And just to cite just one example of this, a particularly telling example from um, the famous Song, uh, statesman and uh, a political thinker, e economic thinker, Wang Anshur's a preface to the explanation of characters, the zi shuo, uh, in which in this preface he explains why the character um, for the word, for the, why the character for husband uh, appears the way it does. And his explanation is that, uh, well, the reason that the character for husband so closely approximates the character for heaven is because the husband is like heaven to his wife. And yet, because no one can be higher than heaven, so the top stroke of heaven is placed higher than the top stroke of the character foo for husband. Um, now, besides highlighting um, the fundamental embeddedness of Chinese theories of language in uh, patriarchal uh, ideologies. Um, this also points to this very strong effort within Chinese tradition of wanting to see um, uh, non-linguistic uh, meaning in these morphologies. So while the modern linguists may scoff at these fanciful etymologies, they point to a deep-seated desire to Im imagine systems of mark making that operate independently of language and thus suggest that we might sort of trace a kind of deep cognitive history of uh, looking for non-linguistic marks all the way from Wang Anshur to Otto Neurath and his isotype, and I would argue um, on to uh, our conference here today, and to suggest that um, we might see a sort of passion for the ideograph or the possibility of writing that stands outside of language or mark making that stands outside of language in as a sort of constitutive um, uh, subject of our panel here today. 
our conference here today. Um, so the question then is, um, to what extent is the desire, is this desire predicated upon an awareness of writing systems? To what extent might we think of mark making as the performance of a writerly act within a paralinguistic frame? Do you need to have writing to, be, uh, to begin to start looking for non-linguistic marks? Um, and I'm reminded of this from actually from uh, Stephen Chrisomalis's comment yesterday about the um, common visual modality of the hand as operating, as sort of explaining some of the commonalities that we see between tallying and systems of numerical notation. Um, what's striking, if you look at the way uh, Chinese, at least in the modern context, uh, numbers are enumerated by the hand in, in a Chinese cultural framework, in a Chinese linguistic framework, is that um, the numerals above five, most notably the numerals six, eight, and ten, are modeled, are actually upside down models of Chinese characters. So in this way, it's clear that an engagement with the script is, uh, is informing the way in which, an engagement with the written characters of Chinese is informing the way in which um, the numerical notation system of the hand is operating. So, um, or it might be interesting to think about the question of whether we should avoid this kind of genealogical term, and in, which implies that mark making necessarily extends from writing, and thus from language, and rather say that writing has a tendency to infect the practices of mark making, and whether we should think in terms of a sort of parasitic infection. Um, now, the intellectual history of defining the boundaries between linguistic and non-linguistic mark making uh, is, I don't know if it was central to the ancient traditions of Mesopotamia and Egypt, but it's certainly central to the epistemological traditions in the post-enlightenment era of studying Egypt and Mesopotamia, and thus I think is very much relevant as a way of framing the discussion that we're going to be hearing in, the, in our next two papers. And so the first of these papers is by Ben Harin. Um, who is a senior university lecturer at Leiden University. Uh, he has published more than 30 articles on a remarkably wide array of uh, topics dealing with ancient Egypt, with paying particular attention to uh, the economy and administrative systems, and especially, and I think this is the reason that he has been invited to our conference here today, on the subject of workman's marks. Now, his paper is entitled Marking and Writing in an Egyptian Workman's Community, and I please ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Hedek. Thank you, Jeff, for this, uh, for this introduction. Uh, thank you. Um, the organization for having me here from across the Atlantic um, and for being able to uh, discuss this highly specific Egyptian material um, in a community that is so distinguished and so mixed. Um, and so coming out of my Egyptological cubicle, um, for uh, not for once, I'm, 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 I'm speaking at more interdisciplinary conferences, but it would seem to be a very, very fertile group to, to throw this in. Um, yes, well, the, the material we will be discussing is, is highly specific, uh, is from a specific community, is a specific system uh, from a specific period, so let's first introduce the specific context very quickly. Um, the workman's marks I'm uh, to discuss today uh, are from uh, an Egyptian site, uh, modernly called Del Medina, um, and it is the site, uh, which you see here in a beautiful photograph, of the workman's village which you see spread out here, um, a village that was inhabited uh, between approximately 1550 to 1070 BCE, the Egyptian New Kingdom, that is. And the people who lived here were responsible for decorating, for cutting out and decorating the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings and the tombs of the royal family in the adjoining uh, valleys. It's a remarkably well-preserved site. As you see, you see the village laid out uh, to, the, to the right. You see the, 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 the chapels, the cult chapels, and the tombs of the workmen themselves around the village. Um, and it, you can actually walk here in the streets, in streets of the 13th century BCE, which is, which is uh, unique, unique. Um, I, I could spend hours telling why this has been so well-preserved, but we have to move on because our topic is a different one. But as you see, uh, on top of the slide, uh, there is much more to be seen here. Uh, we see here uh, some details of the tombs of the individual workmen themselves, who were, after all, 
specialized craftsmen who made the most beautiful Egyptian monuments, there, there still are, uh, with beautiful hieroglyphic inscriptions and beautiful imagery, and they could do as well in their own private tombs. So the quality of these tombs often approaches that of the royal tombs they were daily constructing. Um, we have many sorts of information from this uh, site. Not only do we have these remarkable remains of the workman's settlement, uh, tombs, chapels, um, um, and, and along with that, we have hundreds of private stelae of these workmen in hieroglyphic. We have statues. We have all other kinds of epigraphic and monumental material belonging to this very community, in addition to the royal tombs they were making. Plus, we have thousands of ostraca. Um, in uh, hieratic. Hieratic in ancient Egypt was the script of everyday administration and of correspondence and of literature and religion. Uh, so when thinking about literacy, which we will do in a few minutes, uh, think first about hieratic, a cursive script. Hieroglyphs is a totally different thing. Hieroglyphs is an archaic monumental code and is reserved for specialists, specialist craftsmen who know how to deal with this. Everyday writing, um, as far as writing was going on in ancient Egypt, um, literacy, even numeracy, making numbers, is hieratic, uh, is done in hieratic, and uh, in part its, its function is totally different from, from hieroglyphic. So we have um, hieratic documents, we have ostraca by the thousands, documentary, literary, magical, uh, we have uh, hieroglyphic ostraca, uh, also of a funerary nature, monumental nature, drafts sometimes for work to be done. Uh, and there is hundreds of papyri. Uh, papyri have been preserved to a lesser extent, but still we have hundreds from this desert spot where the workmen were living. Uh, the dry conditions um, made it possible for papyri to survive. And so we have all kinds of papyrus material plus Ostraca. So not only do we have this material archaeological record, we have thousands of texts to go with it. And together they enable us to follow a particular village community in ancient Egypt for several centuries. We, we know these people, we know their families, we know their problems, their personal problems, their court cases, their debts that were never repaid, uh, and so on. It's unique. It's a unique uh, sort of documentation. Um, Yes, and I promised to talk about literacy. Yeah, well, just by, by uh, very sketchy. Um, it, it goes without saying that the group of people who were living here were exceptionally literate. Uh, that is, they were supervised by administrators who were directly responsible uh, towards the royal residence. After all, this was the king's tomb being constructed, one of the priorities of the pharaonic government. And these people were directly under the control of residence officials making, causing a lot of administration, written administration, being here in the village by local scribes. Plus, there was the hieroglyphic production. These people were craftsmen, experts partly, in making hieroglyphic texts. All this makes this village very exceptional in ancient Egyptian context. A normal village in ancient Egypt would never have seen any writing. Uh, peasants would not see writing, but these craftsmen certainly did. Um, and uh, for several reasons, there is an, uh, an estimated literacy uh, in, this, in this village, in, in the late New Kingdom, of, of about 40%. Actually, percentages say very little, and quantifying literacy is, is very, very uh, dangerous business. It's better to speak of sorts of literacy, since there were different sorts of literacy. There were fully literate scribes, administrators. There were fully literate draftsmen, who were experts in creating hieroglyphic text. And there was a mass of workmen, well, a mass varying from about 40 to, to 70 normally, uh, who would have all different degrees of, of literacy, who would encounter hieroglyphs in their daily work, who would sometimes encounter perhaps uh, the writing of their superiors or their family members. Um, but together, all this would see to a remarkable extent of literacy in an Egyptian village community. Literacy in hieratic, literacy in hieroglyphs. And all this makes Dero Medina way beyond exceptional. It's a weird village. It's scary. Normal literacy in ancient Egypt is estimated never have risen above 1%. Uh, and in fact, uh, at many times and in many contexts, it seemed to have been far less. Literacy here meaning mastering writing, being able to read and write to any degree, from a few words to actually being able to compose literary texts or documentary texts in a correct form. Um, the same village has left us uh, records of a totally different nature, uh, uh, records that have been left aside by Egyptologists for, for, for decades. 
simply because they could not be read. And as you know all, uh, scripts and other codes that cannot be read uh, tend to lose interest uh, for scholars until someday someone picks up the thing again uh, for, some, for some particular reason. And it's the same with this uh, stuff you see here. Um, along with the, with the written ostraca, uh, there is a very great number, over a thousand, uh, of, of ostraca inscribed not with hieratic, not with hieroglyphic, but with marks. And every, of those, every one of those marks, which you see here on these examples, represent one individual workman. It is a sort of personal emblem used for recognizing these persons in the administration and also for other purposes, as we will see. Um, over a thousand we have been able to, to, uh, to identify, um, and that makes a poor number in, in, in comparison to the many thousands of, of, of texts. Uh, the documentary Ostraka alone are estimated to be some 12 to 13,000 from this village. Um, so uh, a thousand is, is, is not very much, but it's, it's not marginal either. And um, it's, it was probably very important because it could be handled not only by administrators, but also by the semi-literate workmen themselves. There is a growth of this, of this sort of, of record in the course of the New Kingdom. As you see, there is a limited number for earlier periods, 1450, 1350, 1290, 1190, roughly uh, that would be parts of what we call the 18th and 19th dynasties. Very comparable numbers, 169, 178, and then uh, more than double the amount in a later period, 1190, 1070, the so-called 20th dynasty of Egypt, um, a time in which also hieratic writing exploded in the village. This was the last phase of the village in the New Kingdom uh, in which we have this 40% estimated literacy and we also have the greatest number of uh, Marx ostraca. That is, that is telling in itself. The development of this Marx administration goes very nicely along with the written administration. Well, there are a couple of hundred which we can date no more precise than Remesite or New Kingdom. We leave them out for now and move on to what these marks actually are. Because ostraca is one thing, and being an Egyptologist, um, like most Egyptologists, I'm very focused on hieroglyphs and on hieratic writing. Um, so you grab all that you can read, um, and, and, and ostraca and stele and, and, and hieroglyphic inscriptions on walls tend to, to get far more attention than all other kinds of, uh, of, of images, systematic or not. Um, so uh, it is the ostraca that came to my attention first, but of course the marks on these ostraca represent a much wider system, a system that is also uh, used as uh, property marks on pottery, which you see top right. Much of the pottery found in this village is marked, they are very probably all owner's marks, it, 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 it denotes the possession, uh, the ownership of, of pottery. We also find this uh, very much in the Valley of the Kings where the workmen had their own huts while they were working on the tombs uh, and in which they had their own array of, of, of pottery and a typical set of a workman would be one water jar, one bowl to drink from and one dish and they would usually be marked with the workman's personal mark so that the colleague would not drink from your bowl. Um, but, but also other types of property were marked with these marks and on the left you see uh, some of the beautifully preserved linen garments from the tomb of Ga, 18th dynasty. Uh, he was supervisor of the tomb workforce at this period and his tomb has been found um, uh, uh, intact. With everything in it, you can, you can admire all those objects in the Egyptian Museum of Turin. But uh, among the, the textiles you see, if you look very closely, Ga's personal mark. Uh, and it's also on other objects uh, in the tomb. And you find the same mark um, on, on pottery. Do I have a pointer, by the way? No. Yeah, there is one. Yes, I'm sorry. So, yeah, the same one is here. We find it on pottery in the village. But as long as you're not able to date an object exactly, it's difficult to tell whether the mark belongs to the same person or rather to a family member or a colleague or a superior, as we will see later. Um, then we have these marks also seemingly as votive inscriptions here on the slabs of, of, of the pavement of a local temple of Hathor, uh, chief patron deity of the Theban necropolis. And these are very large. Um, they are 20, 30 centimeters across, so they're, they, they're intended to be monumental here in the temple pavement, uh, scratched by the workman or by a draftsman for the workman. Uh, and they are the same marks basically as on the pottery and on the ostraca and on the textiles. Furthermore, we find these marks in hundreds and hundreds of graffiti throughout the Theban mountains, maybe also mainly with a votive 
uh, function, but that is not clear yet. The graffiti are still uh, uh, subject of, of, of quite, quite a bit of debate. What the graffiti are for? Is it just personal marking? Uh, uh, Kilroy was here. Or is it uh, more religious? Is it both? Um, it may be anything. Um, just short, what I'm presenting today is not only my personal uh, results or personal research, it is the result of a team of, of, of researchers. Um, and uh, during the past years, much of the research has been done by two brilliant PhD assistants, Kira van der Moesel and Daniel, Daniel Soliman, who are both responsible for different aspects. Uh, Kira looking into the theoretical and comparative components of this marking system, looking at other marking systems, similar marking systems, looking at semiotic theory, um, and uh, whereas uh, Daniel Soliman was there for the etiological detective work, trying to identify and date as many records and as many persons owning these marks as possible in order to make the system visible, to see what the local system was and how these marks were used. And then finally, there is Ben Haring, who has tried to write a synthesis about all this, and that synthesis is now uh, in manuscript uh, with Brill publishers. Uh, and I'm very curious to learn what the reviewers have to say about it. Then, how did it start? Um, how do we start? What do these marks represent? Well, as I said, they are identity marks of individual workmen. And uh, one of the first pieces that came to my attention is this Berlin Ostrakon, which represents us already in a far advanced stage uh, of this marking system, where the marks have become incorporated into some sort of pseudo writing, combining all kinds of different symbols, different signs from different systems into one. At the far right, you see a column repeating the same sign all over again, which is short for Su Dei in ancient Egypt, uh, Egyptian, followed uh, from right to left by numbers in hieratic. There is the number 10, which uh, bears some resemblance to hieroglyphic, but it's hieratic numbers, and he using numbers for five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So this would be uh, 15, 16, 17, 18. And this type of ostraca always proceeds with the numbering until 30 and then starts again, from which it is clear that we have a monthly rota here. In combination with the workman's mark, so every date, every calendar date is followed by a personal mark. And we know this, this system also from the hieratic texts. Don't seem to have a glass here. Um, so we have personal marks here in, in, a, in a sort of, of uh, daily rota throughout the month. Uh, we know this system from the hieratic records, and this enables us actually to identify uh, the, the people who own these marks, since we find the names of the same people in hieratic equivalents uh, of these uh, ostraca. And so we know, for instance, that uh, uh, several marks you see at the left side, the bird here, and, and this... Um, um, where is it? Uh, oh yeah, uh, directly on top of it. Um, represent workmen who are called Hor and Mose. And as it happens, the bird is a very crude variant of a falcon, a falcon that reads in Egyptian hieroglyphic and in hieratic as Horus, the god Horus. And people are, thank you so much, um, are actually sometimes called after deities. So this workman is called Hor, his colleague is called Mose, also very clearly a mark inspired by a hieroglyphic sign, the sign Mes, M-S, used for Mose, as you probably know, the Egyptian ancestor of the biblical name Moses. This is not Moses we have here, very probably, this is merely an Egyptian workman called Mose. Um, otherwise, I would be standing at a different conference now, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, many of these marks actually seem to be, have been hieroglyphically inspired, and what is more, to have been inspired by the names of the workmen who owned these marks. So that is true for Mose, it's true for Hor. Um, if you look very carefully, you see here some transverse lines in red, the same bird again, um, and further on, it's very difficult to see, there is a... Um, sign that is actually also inspired by a hieroglyph, um, and it is the, um, the Uzer uh, sign, which is uh, here short for Uzer Hat, another workman we know by name. And we know actually that, that the, the, the relative positions by these marks in the daily rota corresponds to the positions of workmen with these names in the hieratic texts. So we seem to be on the safe side. 
for the moment. Then there is a complication, because we also see signs, other signs inspired by Egyptian hieroglyphs. This is a hoe agricultural instrument. It has the sound mer in ancient Egyptian, M R uh, consonants. It's shown here. Uh, it looks very crude, but Farayans and other Ostraka assure us that this is the hoe indeed. And um, the workman who owns this mark, at the, at the moment this Ostrakon was produced, is called Neferhotep, whose name seems to have nothing to do with the sign Ner. But we know that Neferhotep was a son of a person called Mary Ray. Um, actually, the Neferhotep we have here is very probably a, a grandson of uh, one called Mary Ray. I will spare you the details of Dermodina prosopography. It it's, gives you headaches. Um, but here's oh, so, so this workman is Neferhotep, but he has an ancestor called Mary Ray, which might very well explain why he ends up having a mark that corresponds to a hieroglyph with phonetic value Mer. The mark is inspired by the name of his father, grandfather. Also. So they may be family marks. And the same is true for a person called Penanukis, who's actually a son of Kaza and the hieroglyph that has inspired this particular mark, um, which you see here, is for Ka, uh, K as consonant, basically. So they are family marks, it would appear. But there's more to it. Let's have a closer look. Uh, here we have part of the, of the Mary Ray Neferhotep family. And now you can see why prosopography in Del Medina is a headache. These are a, a limited number of families living in this village. Sons and grandsons having the same names as fathers and grandfathers and nephews and cousins. So we end up with Neferhotep 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, and not always being sure when we encounter a name in Ostrakon whether it is number 15 or 16 or 17. But um, the, the, the detective work mainly by Daniel Solimon has learned us a lot about the tradition of, of, of these marks within families. And here we actually see an ancestor called Mary Ray, who may have been the first one to use this mark, we're not sure. Um, but his son, Neferhotep, uses a totally different mark, which is the sky sign in uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic. Um, and we don't know why Neferhotep had this particular mark. Th th this particular mark may have a yet older tradition in the same family. We, we don't know. We cannot look back that far, unfortunately. Um, note, by the way, that I use hieroglyphic types, which is a bit misleading because in practice the marks look cruder. This is the actual sky sign in the, in the Ostraka. And again, we have here this daily rota, um, plus much more additional information, which I will tell something about later on. Um, the Mary Ray we have, uh, well, the, the sky sign uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as it is here is probably the one uh, held by Neferhotep uh, the 12th. Uh, um, and um, so we seem to be, no, it's the uh, Neferhotep 11, very probably. So we have one family with two different marks, and maybe even more. Um, what is going on here? When Neferhotep 11 became active as a workman in this community, his father, Mary Ray, was also still active and still owner of the mark. So the son had to look for a different mark. We don't know how he got, came by it. Maybe there was an, this mark was already in the family as an alternative for him to pick. But it's only the grandson of Mary Ray, Neferhotep 12, who could use the hoe since Mary Ray 5 had passed away by then. Um, meanwhile, Mary Ray uh, uh, 6, the younger brother of Neferhotep 12, was free to use uh, the sky sign again because it was no longer used apparently by Neferhotep, uh, the father, Neferhotep 11. So sometimes marks skip a generation uh, for these practical reasons. And this all had to be figured out um, because if, if, if a, a sign is not directly inspired by the name of a workman, uh, you are on tricky grounds uh, methodologically. Fortunately, we know enough of the prosopography here to, to make some certain um, attributions. Um, finally, uh, um, we see uh, yet another aspect. Uh, we see here again the daily rota. This is all material from the late New Kingdom, and it's the material that actually best enables us to identify the owners of these marks, given the parallel in the hieratic records. Um, and so here again, we find the workman named Mose. We find the workman named Uzaha. This is slightly later than the Berlin Ostrakon I showed you earlier. In between is a strange mark, uh, a geometric mark, uh, since, yes, uh, these marks do not only include uh, characters of hieroglyphic ins inspiration, but also characters that have nothing to do with writing, apparently, and are uh, geometric abstract marks. Um, and there is yet another category, which we will see later. It's the concrete or, or, or iconic category. It simply depicts objects, beings, without being hieroglyphs, which is tricky field again, because hieroglyphs also depict objects and beings. And sometimes it's very difficult to make the distinction. Anyway. Um, 
so there's this different person having come in between Moses and Uzahat who were following each other very directly in previous periods. Um, and the man who had this particular mark was called uh, Nechemut. But Nechemut was promoted to the position of chief workman, or, or foreman, it's, it's, it's a bit it's a double chief foreman, is a mistake by me. Um, he became a foreman of, of, the, of the gang of workmen. More precisely, he became the foreman of the right side, since the gang was divided in two halves, a right and a left side. And as in almost any culture, the right side is the right side. The right side will always be mentioned first in the documentary texts. So whoever was foreman of the right side was, in a sense, the chief foreman, so to say. And uh, when he became foreman, Nehemut adopted a different mark, which is this, the B, which is a very powerful royal emblem. It actually denotes the pharaoh of Egypt as the king of the north, of, the, of northern Egypt. And it cannot be coincidence that Nehemut chose this particular mark when he became foreman. He actually denoted himself as the local king, so to say. Thereby leaving this mark, which he, which he had previously, for another workman who replaced him in his position in the daily rota. And the Pasen uh, uh, workman who, who took over the mark was, was no relative of Nehemut. But the position was free, the mark was free, so Pasen was free to use it. And from then on, very probably, Pasen continued this mark in his family. It had been occupied previously by who, someone who's now chief workman, no less. I mean, it, it makes the mark prestigious. There is prestige connected with these marks, and you see that apart from family tradition, the marks also present hierarchical uh, position in the gang. So a complicated picture. Uh, one more illustration of this. Here again we have columns. This is no longer a, a duty roster. This is simply a column with marks representing probably the entire right side of the gang headed by their chief workman, who is probably still Nechemut here, uh, with the B, but in a cursive rendering, hieratic rendering, which is also used in these, in these marks. Um, and in a corresponding list, uh, now in Prague, you see the left side of the gang starting with a different sign, a geometric sign, which somehow seems to be associated with the left side. Uh, we will see in a minute why that is. Uh, no, we don't know why that is, but we can see it is from the left side. I, I can illustrate that. You have a smaller number of workmen here, again starting with the chief workman of the left side um, with his geometric uh, mark. In all cases they are followed by a sign that is clearly of hieratic um, and here pseudo-hieroglyphic inspiration and it's the sign for scribe, zesh, to write. And this is used for the scribe, the chief administrator of the village, the one who kept the records to show to higher authorities and who, who kept track of the supplies and the work at the royal tomb, and also for local juridical uh, affairs. He would always be mentioned in text after the chief workman, and we find the same thing in the Marx list, and then would follow the, the rest of the workmen in, in, in a more or less canonical order. So these Ostraka I've shown you actually represent the last stage, the latest stage of this marking system. The markings, the marks as part of a, of a system of pseudo-writing. Um, how did it start? These are the earliest examples we have from this particular uh, context, from the Valley of the Kings or the Odel Medina. Uh, they date from about uh, 1450 BCE, Tutmosa III. And as you can see here, the marks are quite neatly made. We don't know who these people are. For, for this early period, we don't have the high record records to, to back this up. Uh, there are further examples. This looks more crude, is a more crude style than this one. We will see more examples, and this uh, appears on at first sight to have been made by, uh, by a, a, a drunken person. But um, what is going on here actually is that these marks can be used by skilled scribes and by draftsmen for making administrative records on Ostraka or for other purposes, but the same marks are indeed used by less literate workmen, which explains the extremely crude forms they take. This is clearly made by someone who had no, who did not have the habit of making uh, hieratic or hieroglyphs. Where do they come from? Um, that is not entirely certain, but it is most likely that this marking system finds its origin in older Egyptian marking systems. Of course, that is very likely. There are different things to choose from, and two very prominent traditions in ancient Egypt for marks, for identity marks, would be pot marks on the one hand and builder's marks on the other. Um, and for a number of reasons, it's very unlikely that pot marks are the source of inspiration. I leave that for now. 
but if there are any questions, I'm glad to take them. It's most likely that the marking system that we see in Del Medina finds its origin in much older marking systems used in monumental building, which sounds reasonable because, after all, constructing the royal tomb in the Valley of the Kings is a monumental royal monumental building project. Plus, the, 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 the repertory of marks, the, the repertoire of marks in those earlier periods is very similar to the sort of marks we see at Dero Medina. Again, we have partly um, uh, sets of marks inspired by hieroglyphs, we have uh, concrete or iconic marks, and we have geometric or abstract marks. Uh, and we still, still see the same sort of marks employed also in temple building in the New Kingdom. And temples were all around the settlement of Del Medina, so it's very likely that this is where the inspiration comes from. Um, with the single difference that the marks in older monumental building in Egypt were team marks, were not personal identity marks, but denoted groups of people. So we would have to assume that the earliest marks in Del Medina uh, now had a different function. Uh, they denoted individual workmen. Here again, a beautiful example of the crude style of the marks as we find them in the Valley of the Kings. These are large chunks of limestone. We still dare to call these things ostraca, um, um, although they're not exactly written material. They're not exactly pictorial material either. It's very specific. This is it's the marking system, and every one of these marks represents a single workman. And someone, for some purpose, collected a number of those marks on an ostracon, and he did so not with uh, scribes, the delicate brush of the Egyptian scribe, but he did so with the proverbial broomstick, or rather, very probably, with the, with the, with the brushes they used for decorating tomb walls, which, was the, the tool, which were the tools at hand. Um, here another example of, yes, thank you, um, um, a beautiful dish, probably representing the entire gang, and hey, here is our Mr. Ha again, very probably, since the dish dates from, uh, from, from the period in which he was active. Um, I'll skip this one. Um, again, an illustration, uh, the, the, the Leiden Ostracon I've shown you before, with some pride, not because it's a Leiden Ostracon, but because it was the first Ostracon we were actually able to read sign by sign. And this mainly thanks to parallels in hieratic uh, material. And here you see, for instance, why this particular geometric sign seems to be, um, must be associated with the left side because this triangular thing denotes a delivery of dates, dates meaning fruits of the date palm. Um, for the left side, we have a corresponding delivery for the right side here. Um, and so you see that in addition to the calendar dates and the marks, there are additional symbols, signs for commodities, plus there are numbers, as you see. So this is a sort of, of shadow administration, you might say. It is paralleled by the hieratic administration and maybe supported the written administration, but it was a different system, a pseudo-written system, since it does not really record language, although phonetics are to some extent involved. When you know these people were called Mose and Uzerhat. But uh, for the rest, there is, there, is, there is a sort of syntaxis. There's a fixed order, date, person, commodity, number, uh, but there's no grammar. Um, what is very important to note is that in the course of the New Kingdom, the amount of the, the, the proportion of signs inspired by hieroglyphs and hieratic increases. So the earliest ostraca show a set of marks, 50% uh, approximately of which are inspired by writing. Whereas in later periods, we find 65 and, and ultimately 80% of the marks inspired by writing. So there's an increasing influence of writing of local writing on the local marking system. The marking system itself is not writing, but marking systems in ancient Egypt have always been partly writing, since there's always a proportion of marks inspired by hieroglyphic uh, and sometimes hieratic signs. What you see here is spectacular. It's, it's uh, an ostracon clearly made by a hieratic scribe. It's, it's a clear hieratic ductus, someone who really could write, uh, who also used the marks in combination here every time with the number uh, five. So the marking system was also adopted, was used by uh, l fully literate administrators. Um, something from the theoretical perspective, uh, some, a, a body of theory that, that seemed particularly appropriate for our purposes is the work by James Elkins. We looked at a lot of semiotic literature, I can tell you. Again, uh, there's, there's too much to, to, to present here. Um, what is striking to us in, in Elkins, uh, art historian Elkins's view, is his division of any type of visual communication in the three components, writing, notation, and picture. And it was, um, um, uh, um, it seemed very appropriate to us 
to uh, see our three different categories of, of marks in this very system, although, strictly speaking, Elkins meant something different by notation, uh, by notation of, he means, for instance, um, uh, tabular format, uh, layout, and so there are all kinds of aspects in documents, in written documents also, that are not writing, obviously, this is notation. But uh, we accommodated the abstract or geometric marks in this way. This threefold classification, writing, abstract, concrete, or iconic, is found in many, many marking systems worldwide. And I'll spare you all the different marking systems, but simply highlight one, the medieval mason's mark, which Professor um, uh, Steve Houston already uh, presented yesterday. Um, interculturally, the nearest parallel I've been able to find. Perhaps no coincidence, because these marks were used by workmen who were producing monumental architecture. And um, much is still obscure about medieval mason's marks, uh, the earlier ones at least. And uh, they seem to have been practical. They may have been used for, for quality control, maybe even for payment of individual masons. They were also, it seems, used for votive purposes. So many marks in cathedrals are in spots not visible to the human eye, but, but, but very much central above the choir, above the altar, which gave them a very prominent position. Um, many riddles, but morphologically, the set of marks is very similar. It's again inspired by writing, alphabetic characters, of course, in this particular case. And there are objects among them, and there are abstract signs, crosses, other things. Well, crosses are not exactly abstract in a Christian uh, cathedral context. Um, but um, many other signs are. So uh, there are uh, geometric signs among them. And we see them especially in the late Middle Ages, when we even find the mason's marks incorporated in written contracts. Um, we happen to know this person, he's called Martin Wastel. This is an early 16th century contract for delivery at stone, of stone at Hampton Court in London. Uh, and the same Martin Wastel we know from the Netherlands who was involved in building uh, some monumental churches uh, there. So these people could not write. Some contracts even specify this. They used the marks while they could not write because they could not write. So they signed with their marks. And the marks became a sort of, 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 of personal but also family marks, and in this sense, also other people than builders, merchants, for instance, use them as their personal mark. You see here a beautiful signet ring, 14th century Germany. So, um, rounding up, um, we have these different categories of marks. It's difficult to distinguish very often. I already told you that hieroglyphs also represent objects and beings, so we cannot always be certain whether a particular mark was of hieroglyphic inspiration or not. And the sign, the mark you see here at the top, top left, has puzzled us for quite a while. We were inclined to, to, to range it among the geometric marks. If it resembles anything, perhaps it is an insect. Um, but there were different uh, variants. Here we have more strokes in the same mark. And if you classify this as geometric, you were inclined to classify it differently because there's a different number of strokes. But in the end, it appeared to be a crude rendering of variants that have a more hieroglyphic shape and it's actually the equivalent of the Egyptian hieroglyph representing a, a necklace, which is the hieroglyph for gold. The pot, on the other hand, must be a concrete referent because it has very different shapes. You may have the, the, the pot mark, the, the mark representing the pot, uh, with or without handles or liquid. You have the same in hieroglyphs, but these will be three different hieroglyphs with different meanings. In a marking system, it's not, meaning that the actual mark is not the precise graphic form, but the mark is the, the idea, the concept. So this was Mr. Pot. That's it. It was probably not called Pot, but um, the Pot was his mark. And however you render that exactly is less important. Same with scorpions, which have, have a lot of different forms. Um, uh, but uh, scorpions did have a lot of different forms in hieroglyphic also, so there's another methodological problem. Fuzzy borders. It's not always possible to distinguish precisely between abstract, hieroglyphic, and concrete. And as far as the morpholo morphology goes, uh, anything would seem to go. Anything goes, uh, really. Uh, you can have all possible kinds of marks. You can have all possible precise graphic renderings of your own individual mark. Plus, there are many ways to interpret marks. Um, I'll be finished very quickly. Um, here, for instance, you see a mark, a hieroglyph, that was the inspiration for a particular mark, a mark used at some points by workmen called Inher Gau. The, the hieroglyph is for the Egyptian verb ini, to bring, 
and actually the verb ini is also in the workman's name, in her gau. So this might be seen as a phonetic abbreviation of his name, as long as we are dealing with a workman called in her gau, but the family from which these workmen came also had other people, uh, and for instance at some point this same mark was held by a person called Kenna. Now someone who would walk around in 12th century BC del Medina and come across this mark could interpret this in various ways depending on his knowledge. If he was personally familiar, acquainted with the family of Inar Gau and Kenna, he would know that this is the mark of Kenna and that his father is called Inar Gau, that's why he has the mark. If he doesn't know the family, he would simply read Ini and not know what to make of it. Um, and if he wouldn't know any hieroglyph of, or any writing, he would think yet other things. So marks mean very different things to different people. And given the varying, the different degrees of literacy in this community, there must have been different meanings to these marks for the different members of the community. Um, literacy then. Um, is, is something, uh, if we want to study this, we should not limit ourselves to written, truly written accounts, but there are all sorts of literacy, and the marking system truly is a representative of another sort of literacy, incorporating much that is also in writing, but in a totally different way. So there were people who mastered this marking system, but who did not master writing, and that makes 40% or any number actually a very uh, 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 unuseful uh, thing to write down. There, is, there are visual codes related to writing. I feel very attracted to the notions of visual or iconic literacy and to pictorial syntax, but it may be very much influenced here already by Elkins and other theorist, theoretical authors. Conclusion. We have Dermodina marks. They express the identity of individuals and they descend from older such marks, uh, which have been developed under influence of, partly under influence of writing, and in Del Medina, this even takes a much stronger turn. In Del Medina, given the omnipresence of writing, hieratic and hieroglyphic, the marking system is, is severely subject to, uh, to, that particular, to those particular writing systems. Marking systems are not exceptional. They have been used at all times in ancient Egypt, at least during the historical period. I haven't been specific about the point of origin, nor on the point of origin of writing, somewhere in the middle or later fourth millennium BC. The very difficult subject as far as we can see, writing marking systems in Egypt are as old or at least as old as writing, but it's, it's, we, we cannot clearly say whether one precedes the other. Um, Anything goes with this marking system, yes. It's a very open system as far as types uh, and morphological rules are concerned. The one thing that makes this into a system is the administrative context, the function of this marking system. There is a limited number of workmen, and there can never be more marks in use at any time than there is than the number of active workmen. Plus, there is the family context, there is the hierarchy of the workmen's gang that all determine how exactly the marks are used. So, a system, uh, rule restrictions, yes, uh, from the organization and the families, morphologically, very much an open system. I thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. A couple of questions. Please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm interested in, to, to what extent can we know whether particular workman's marks are related to hieroglyphs or hieratics? Mm -hmm. I, and the reason I guess I'm asking is my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that literacy in hieratic would be really much higher than hieroglyphs. But yes. you indicated that, I think you had one table where actually the percentage from hieroglyphs was extraordinarily high. Yep. Yep. And I'm yep. wondering, does that really indicate that we really have a group, that when we talk about literacy, we're really talking about biscriptal literacy, that they're really, they know hieroglyphs and hieratic, and they have this marking system, but they're deriving the marks hieroglyphs, or are there some that we can identify paleographically as coming from hieratic rather than mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's fair, mostly it's not problematic to, to distinguish hieratic and hieroglyphic signs from each other. Um, I, I gave some, some, some very clear examples. Um, well, here, yes. Um, so the signs here used for, for the scribe uh, are clearly hieratic. Um, what has been done here, it's very interesting, because what you see here is actually on the right, the right component is the hieratic sign for scribe. And um, 
that would be scribe in hieratic. And it goes back historically to a uh, hieroglyphic uh, depiction of the brush with the, the scribe's kit with, with colors uh, attached to it. So that would be the, the hieroglyphic equivalent. And what the maker of these marks has tried to do is give this a hieroglyphic resemblance because there is some notion of this sign having hieroglyphic relations, but he may not have been able to do so, or maybe he just used a traditional form that existed already. But this sign is not really hieroglyphic, nor is it hieratic. It's a mixed form. Uh, this is clearly hieratic, but most of the, of the uh, marks inspired by writing appear to be hieroglyphic, yes. And this is a consequence of there being hieroglyphic literacy in this particular craftsman's village, which included expert draftsmen who knew how to make hieroglyphic inscriptions. That makes this village way beyond exceptional. Not, it's exceptional that there was hieratic writing going on at all. Uh, in, a, in a peasant village, there, there would be no writing. Uh, peasants do not even appear in documentary text in ancient Egypt. Um, but, but in this village of, of royal craftsmen, including expert, uh, expert draftsmen, uh, there was a, a wide knowledge of hieroglyphs. Um, and in the older history of the marking systems, um, I said, you, you have a very similar repertoire, also including um, many, uh, many hieroglyphic signs. That is, that is particularly true for the marking systems belonging to monumental building. And there again, of course, monumental building would bring you into contact with hieroglyphic inscriptions. So it's no surprise that hieroglyphs are a frequent source of inspiration in the communities of the workmen who, who made these things. Uh, marking systems in, in other communities might have looked totally different. Pot marks, of course, uh, is a different story. Um, even pot marks may sometimes be, be influenced by, by hieroglyphic writing. Most of the time, pot marks tend to be simple strokes and geometric devices uh, being the products of, of totally illiterate potters in rural communities. Uh, but sometimes, pots are the products of ateliers or of, of potters who are in the royal service or temple service. And then again, you see this influence of hieroglyphic coming. The, I think uh, Steve was first. Uh, I had a comment and then a question. The comment had to do with something that's perceptible in colonial situations of contact, such as here in Rhode Island, but also when the Spaniards first come across uh, Easter Island, way out in the Pacific, in which uh, they create these documents which are held to be contractual, which actually led to the transfer of local lands here, in which Brown University sits, to uh, um, from Native Americans to, uh, in this case, English settlers. But in each case, in each one of these uh, sorts of documents, uh, drawn up contractually by the colonial authorities, you tend to have these emblems that are introduced, where you have these. Uh, 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 emblems that correspond to the individual identity of the people uh, assigning their prestige and their, their authority to these documents. But anyway, it's, it's fascinating which you have these collisions going on of that sort. The question I had to do, had to pose, had to do with this uh, switch from a kind of a group orientation in some of these identifying tags to uh, the individual aspect that you were referring to later in Daryl Medina. Is this have something to do with the extraordinary nature of that community or something more broadly going on in Egypt at that time? Mm. Difficult. It's one of the most difficult questions in, the, in, this, in this entire research. What exactly is going on in the early New Kingdom that makes this, this, this sort of marking system oriented towards individual persons? We know for a fact that uh, slightly later we have, we have more. Uh, so, so the individual marks are there to stay. But this is the first time we see them, um, and we have speculated whether this is a growing awareness of individual craftsmen and their prestige uh, uh, making this possible. It, it's, it's, it, it, it would be possible, but we don't have any real answer to this. Um, the only thing I can say is that, that's, that somehow the exceptional nature of this community is responsible for, for the way this particular marking system is, uh, is used. Um, it seems that um, the the there, there was no immediate presence in the earlier New Kingdom, was no immediate presence of, of hieratic scribes. There were supervisors, of course, who kept records, must have, they have not been preserved. But from the 18th dynasty, uh, the early New Kingdom, we don't have any hieratic texts locally discarded. So um, there was much less writing going on locally, uh, and the writing that was going on was hieroglyphic, it was in the tomb. So, um, which explains there is no influence of hieratic at this, at this particular point. Um, we don't know the exact nature of this of this organization um, of, of workmen, and we don't know how they were supervised exactly. 
um, these, these marks you see here were found not at Del Medina, but in a quarry uh, nearby. A quarry we know that has been used for the building of one of the mortuary temples of the pharaohs on the, on the, uh, on the edge of the cultivation. And the marks are, are, are exactly the same as the, ones, as the earliest ones we have from Del Medina. Very possibly, it's even the same persons, which means that these craftsmen were not only used for royal tomb building, but were also employed in uh, quarrying for uh, the temple. And that throws an entirely different light on the nature of this of this group of workmen who in later times appear to have been much more isolated. Um, we have too many uncertainties, in short, <laughs> to, to be able to answer that question uh, satisfactorily. I think there's time for one more question. I'll ask you. Okay. Uh, thanks for this great talk. Um, I was wondering about the sort of interplay between the use of red and black in these uh, inscriptions and also sort of the materiality of the shape of it, like orientation. Some of these things are, are seem very organized, others just seem to be all over the place. Uh, I was wondering if, if there's any sense of what's going on, maybe in chronological terms or, or, or literate terms, or if there's any idea of why that could have been, as far as you've been able to identify some of these marks. You mean, for instance, this, this, this sort of thing, the, the, the crude yeah. forms, uh, why, why yeah. the red, why the, why the haphazard way of, of having all these marks on one piece of stone? Mm -hmm without any organization in registers or columns. Um, I think it has very much to do with, with, with uh, the person who, who made this. And in this case, I would say it, it is one of the workmen themselves, maybe a local superior, who is not a scribe. Um, in later periods, in later in the New Kingdom, when literacy was much more spread, uh, the, the, the foreman would have been able to write. Uh, we, we know for a fact that they did. Um, and of course, there were the draftsmen. Um, but but this, this, this is made by a hand that, that, that is clearly not familiar with, with hieroglyphic or with hieratic, and who chooses a totally different way of rendering these marks than a professional scribe or draftsman would do. Uh, and actually, most of the pieces of the, of the early New Kingdom are this, are like this. And, and, and the, 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 let's say, the, the neater ones, um, this is probably the, the product of, of a draftsman. Um, uh, who, who, is, who, is, who is capable of making hieroglyphs, at least, at the very least. So it seems to depend very much on the, uh, on the skills and the knowledge of the person who produces it, uh, as much perhaps as on the purpose of it. And that is often, of course, where we are in the dark. In the absence of written documentation, we don't know what this series of marks was for. Was it practical at all? We, we assume that it was, mostly. But leaving uh, a chart with the marks of all the workmen who are active working at the royal tomb may just possibly be votive. It may be, in fact, just leave your presence in the valley, as would later be done in the form of, of graffiti. Uh, so, uh, and this, this seems to be more, more um, administrative, but we don't know. We have a row of, of marks accompanied by strokes and dots, which may conceivably have been for supplies, food rations, uh, but also for days of presence or absence. Um, and of course, uh, having to add the, the points necessitates having the marks in a more orderly way. Um, I would say it depends very much on the practical context and the knowledge of the, of the maker. Thank you very much. So our next speaker uh, for our next uh, talk, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Matthew Rutz, from the Department of Egyptology and Assyriology here at uh, Brown. Uh, Matthew is an expert in Akkadian and Sumerian documents from the latter half of the second millennium BC. He works on issues pertaining to ancient Mesopotamian intellectual and religious history, and uh, the study specifically of texts as archaeological objects. He's published numerous articles and chapters, and is the author of Bodies of Knowledge in Ancient, ancient Mesopotamia, the Diviners of Late Bronze Age MR, and their tablet collection. Today, he's going to be talking to us on the subject of primordial signs and inscribed bodies, reading images of script in late Assyrian scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Retz. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and thank you to uh, John and to Steve for um, inviting me to come and present in this um, this fascinating interdisciplinary group. Um, so when, when Steve and John approached me about presenting to this group, um, I, I thought through a few 
ideas in terms of uh, ways in which the material from ancient Iraq can speak to the issue of <clears throat> making marks. Um, and of course, uh, from um, one of our talks last night, we had this uh, stimulating introduction of the idea of tokens and tallies and various early notation marks in late prehistory in, in uh, the Mesopotamian field. And this, this continues straight on through. So we have examples of, um, of, of tallies and tokens, uh, various sealing practices, um, even uh, bizarrely embodied practices like uh, clay technologies that use fingernails and, f um, and impressions of feet and occasionally even people biting tablets. Those are the weirdest of all. Um, but so what I decided to do was, was take something uh, from my own research um, and, um, and connect it to this theme in a way that uh, I, I hope is interesting and productive. And that is, um, I'm interested in what I'm calling uh, images of script. And that is um, graphs that are beyond language, but maybe just beyond language. Uh, so that is um, marks that have been purposed over literally millennia by the point I'm, I'm dealing with them. Um, in, and, and connected in intimate ways with natural language, several natural languages, in fact. Uh, but then they're taken and, and purposefully deformed by their users into things that are, to us, unrecognizable, and probably to them, uh, at least um, with the exception of the, the very high-end users who are doing it, uh, also unrecognizable as writing, but still very much um, used as marks. <clears throat> All right, so, so to do that, I'd like to first just say a few words about what I mean by images of script, and then I'll walk you through a bit on the, um, the context and what I'm calling the script ecology of the period of time in ancient Iraq that interests me today. And then I'm going to talk a bit about what I'm calling primordial signs, these, um, these creations, these deformations of script, and, um, and inscribed bodies, and how um, I hope it'll be clear how the two relate by the end of my, my talk. <clears throat> So in terms of um, images of script, um, what interests me, and this is uh, actually very nicely um, prefaced with um, examples from Egypt uh, by, by Ben Haring in the previous talk, <clears throat> has to do with the, um, the idea of making images of script, that is, um, writing versus drawing script. Um, and so in this context, uh, it's, it's quite useful to think about um, the different cognitive and uh, embodied practices of writing versus drawing. We tend to think of those as associated with um, either a low level of familiarity in the case of drawing um, or low level of learning in the case of drawing script. So uh, as script users, we all start out imitating forms and drawing, not quite writing. And I think this is nicely illustrated in these um, limestone ostraca that we just saw with the actual paintbrush uh, that have uh, maybe simpler uh, forms. Um, the other thing that, um, that interests me about this, I as I hope will become apparent, are the different um, media and technologies of writing and drawing. Um, sometimes they're, they're the same and overlap, other times they're, they're quite different. And then also the scale. Um, so we'll see, it's, it's, a, it's a minor point in the material I'm looking at, but I, as I was thinking about differences between writing and drawing, specifically marks that have a use as script, um, it's, it, it strikes me that scale matters in the sense that um, it, it's, it's quite different if we are, um, we, we are drawing large scale graffiti. If you're walking around in a city and you see someone has spray painted, um, it, it is script, um, but it is drawn. It's not written in quite the same way. Although a user who can write, I think will draw differently as I hope to show. And I'm not going to belabor this point, but I, I did a, a, a quick survey, quick and dirty survey of um, some of the, uh, picking one major language from ancient Iraq, uh, some of the, the terminology associated with both writing and drawing, and there are interesting bits of overlap, often having to do with issues of, um, of media and user. All right, so that's the, the kind of, some of the general background I had in mind in approaching this material. Now, simply just to get oriented in um, place and time. So I'm going to be looking. So this is um, obviously our, uh, the heartland of Mesopotamia between the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, modern uh, nation state of Iraq, and uh, of course, Syria and Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. I'm going to be focusing uh, largely today on northern Iraq um, around particularly. So this is the old capital of Ashur. Um, and the, the last capital of Nineveh will be very important for our, our purposes. 
Um, and the two sites I'm going to focus on in terms of the material I'm going to show you and talk about today are, um, are Nineveh in um, the, the final capital, and then one of, uh, one of the, the several um, last peripatetic capitals of Assyria, uh, the city of Kalhu. And these, if these names are familiar, it's for very depressing reasons in that Kalhu, um, modern day Nimrud, was one of the first archaeological, ancient archaeological sites um, destroyed by the goons of ISIS. Um, and of course, Nineveh is um, now, um, so you can see the ancient mound of Nineveh uh, here, the city wall. Um, and you can see the way the modern city of Mosul has, has crept even over the archaeological site here. This is all modern building. Um, but for our purposes, what's most important um, is, the, uh, is the citadel uh, called Kuyunjik. And it's on this site where we have several important repositories of, um, of clay tablets that were uh, sealed in the archaeological record when Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BCE. Uh, and this is a body of, of text that we refer to, I think with good reason, as Ashurbani Paul's library, or more appropriately, Ashurbani Paul's libraries. And we come to that ascription by the place and by certain uh, very specific, sometimes quite florid, uh, colophons that appear on these clay tablets. So these are the, the two sides of a single clay tablet that refer to the property of the palace of Ashurbani Paul with all sorts of pompous titles and um, claims about his abilities in the scribal arts. Never mind that, of course, he's almost certainly not writing the vast majority of the some 30,000 clay tablets that, we, um, that we've recovered from Nineveh, that were recovered in the um, 1850s um, in Nineveh. We also have interesting examples of um, a, a difference in script between um, the, the text on the tablet and um, the marking of the, 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 the possessive uh, property of the palace. Um, so this is maybe from some stamp, um, or at least aping a, a stamp style that we know of very well from elsewhere. And then a, a very small but fascinating group of, of objects in which um, they've done something unusual for them, quite typical in other writing traditions, but they've, they've written in ink onto what was presumably already dried clay. So this is how we constitute this body of text and why we think of them as a more or less official repository of, um, of of information. And this information, I should, I, should, I should stress, is very broad. We call it a library for a good reason, in that it was an, a, a concerted, conscious attempt to pull together all of the knowledge of the day in one place um, and ascribe it and associate it with um, this particular last famous uh, king of Assyria. All right, so and then the other site is uh, Kalhu, not very far away. Um, um, known before it was uh, um, mangled by, um, by, by the thugs of, of um, IS um, for first excavations in the 19th century and these uh, fantastical watercolors trying to evoke life in Nineveh. Um, these were done in the, um, in the late 19th century. And then from a series of, um, of comparatively better excavations in, so in, in, whereas Nineveh was excavated in the 1850s, we know about Kalhu from the 1950s. And because of that, we have a much better control on where the information, where the, ta the in, for our purposes, the inscribed objects, the tablets are coming from. And so we have this temple called Ezida um, from, from uh, Kalhu. And the, um, the material I'm going to show you today is associated with, with finds from the so-called tablet room um, in this temple. All right, so we have, um, two bodies, and this is an, an order of magnitude smaller collection. So whereas one collection is, is 30,000, this is more on the 300, 400 uh, total tablets. But um, what's interesting for our purposes is that these, um, unlike some of the examples of drawing script that I was alluding to earlier, um, the cases I'm going to show you, I think, are of very high-end users, um, so very accomplished users of script, um, writers and readers of script, who then are are drawing um, things that are like script and deforming things that are like script, and so we and we have in the in in Assyria in this period um, a whole um, vast class of of literate people of scribes, uh, among whom there is a small set of people very cozy with the royal court, uh, sometimes placed in the imperial capital itself, um, and uh, other times at these other nodes of the Assyrian heartland. Uh, just to back up for a second. 
uh, yeah, of, the, of what we call the Assyrian heartland, other times posted um, at its height um, in the seventh century BCE from the Nile to the Persian Gulf uh, elsewhere um, throughout the empire. All right, I apologize. All right, so in, and in terms of um, what I'm calling the, the script ecology of Assyria, I wanted to just say a few words about the, the, um, the media and how that, um, how that might impact the phenomenon I'm interested in talking about, that is, these, these made images of script. And so most of our material, of course, uh, comes from the, the technologies of clay that take off in a big way in Mesopotamia um, in late prehistory and are used straight on through uh, to the, the beginning of the Common Era. Um, but of course, that is in part an artifact of um, uh, preservation in the archeo archeological record that we have uh, clay tablets that were incised with the reed stylus um, many times over, but we know that they were also doing other things. So there's a, some kind of floppy medium that's probably um, parchment, maybe papyrus uh, being written. You can even see that the implements are being held in a different way. So this is a, a limestone relief. We have these from several monumental buildings in the Assyrian heartland. Um, and we know, so this is from a larger scene in which an administrative act is taking place of reading and recording, obviously. Um, but we know from um, a few other bits preserved in the archaeological record that this is not the only practice going on. And that is, we, so we have, in this case, an ivory writing board, but of course there were also mainly wood writing boards that just simply don't preserve in this, um, in this climate very well. So that, that distorts our picture a little bit, but from various um, signals in the archaeological and textual record, we can construct a pretty elaborate, what I call, uh, ecology of scripts. Um, that uh, I think is not surprising for an imperial center at its apex, where we have, um, as Assyria in the northern Iraq um, is in various uh, conflict with uh, Babylonia in the south, the southern dialect of the Semitic Akkadian language used at the time, as well as the actual writing habits, the, the, the very simple sign forms of, uh, of the cuneiform script um, are, are adopted in and used widely throughout the, the center of the, of the empire. Um, so that would be the, the near neighbor, and I'll come back to that a little bit later as an important, um, as an important facet of this um, script ecology, and especially of the, um, the topic of making images of script. Uh, but then, of course, there are also other writing systems altogether that use uh, other media and um, were, were sometimes used by agents of the empire, other times by uh, captives of the empire um, in, in ways that are not always terribly well preserved in the archaeological record, so such as alphabetic inscriptions written in um, Aramaic. I'll show you an example in just a second. Uh, here's one as well, a few in Hebrew. And then we have this interesting case of hieroglyphs. So of course, Egyptian hieroglyphs, this is a, um, a very surprising ceiling from Nineveh of, um, of a um, late Egyptian king, um, Shabako. Um, and we know of a few examples of Luvian hieroglyphs from Anatolia and North Syria that have made their way into centers in, in Assyria. Um, but we have this curious example of, um, of an attempt, we think, at Assyrian hieroglyphs. So, this, so as the empire expands and there are all these different um, scripts brought under the, um, under the umbrella of the empire, um, there's an anxiety felt at home that we need something that, that is also um, beautifully uh, iconic, representational, um, in a way that linear cuneiform is not. Now, I should say, um, in terms of, before I, uh, moving on, so just a bit about the cuneiform script, the linear cuneiform script as it's known uh, by the time the material I'm looking at in the late 8th and, and through the 7th century BCE is this, um, is this highly linear um, uh, stylized uh, form. So whereas in the late 4th millennium, um, there are some still representational, iconic, or indexical signs. By this point, um, it's, um, even by users, largely a symbolic uh, system. And one in which we have a single sign, like this sign that we, we call the Ka sign, um, that can have lots of different readings. So each of these sounds in natural language um, or um, words can be uh, written with this one sign. And we also have a lot of, uh, of homophonous signs. So an example would be 
if you want to make the sound goo in natural language, or um, things that you could write with these signs that, that um, have nothing to do with the sound goo, but have to do with the words originally in Sumerian um, that uh, are associated with the, the graph. Um, so we, we differentiate them using indices, so numbered indices. You can see poor old goose six got demoted. We don't think that exists anymore, but, um, but we assign different numbers um, to each of these signs. Um, so, this, so this is a, a complex non-alphabetic script and in which a single sign can have many readings. That's the, the takeaway. So this is not surprising to those of you who work in non-alphabetic scripts, but for those of us most comfortable with an alphabet, this is, um, this is surprising and worth keeping in mind. All right, so in, and in terms of how uh, normal users of this script um, uh, would encounter other types of, of marks and uh, other types of writing, I take it as an example a simple sale contract in which um, we have obviously cuneiform writing on a clay tablet, but also ceilings and then um, a little etching on, uh, just a second here, on the edge of the tablet. So this is the seal of Bail Acheshu, son of so-and-so, the horse trainer, of the personal bodyguard, and the owner of the woman being sold. And then we, so we're told that this is his seal, and then we get the impression, and then we get the, the contract of sale, and on, and, and the, the script reads left to right in the, in one, in the cuneiform script, and in um, this little um, alphabetic uh, notation on the side, it not only is a different script, a different language, but even a different orientation. So we just get simply that this is the deed of this woman, Arba Il Sharat, who is in fact the woman being, being sold. Right, so this would be uh, something that a normal scribe producing text would um, be expected to um, produce. We also have, in terms of the script ecology, things that are not quite as well preserved, the, um, these um, Aramaic ostraca, um, as well as um, a few Luvian, hieroglyphic Luvian ostraca, um, but this is not, so they, they make their way to the center of the empire, but they're not very well, um, well preserved. All right. And, all right, so, now when it, when it comes time to um, and focusing on the cuneiform script, when it comes time to um, uh, transmit how the cuneiform script works, um, one of the solutions is to come up with simply a list of signs, just as we have a, a list of signs in our, in our alphabetic ref repertoire that has a conventional order. And so there are many conventional orders that emerge over time, but one of them is uh, text that we very simply call syllabary A. So this is a conventional order of simply learning and reproducing, cataloging all the inventory of things that you can write. Um, and, uh, and this dates to um, originally to um, about 1,000 years earlier, so say around the 18th century BCE, whereas this manuscript is from uh, the 7th century BCE. So this is a, a very long, persistent tradition. And by this time period, they're doing things a little more elaborate. They're not just listing signs, but they're listing um, these these graphs, as well as various pronunciations of the graphs, and then the name of the graph. So it's, it's become a slightly more complicated system, uh, but still basically the same, in that they're, they're worrying about this, this polyphonic principle, and then they're also worrying about what to simply call this thing. All right, so um, what's interesting for, for my, my purposes today is that um, we have something patterned on this this text, this basic syllabary, but that does something very different. And we refer to this as a paleographic syllabary. And that is, it takes the same order of signs and simply reproduces them, a little clearer maybe in the drawing, um, with so the, this little entry marker that I've just called one here, um, but it reproduces a much older form of the sign. So whereas I, I told you this, this, this organization of uh, the writing system dates from about, um, say, 1700, uh, 1750 BCE, these forms of the sign date to around that time as well. So they've, this is a clear example of um, ancient antiquarians, antiquarianism, which we know of from, um, of course, lots of places in the ancient world, but is um, a very strong tradition in Mesopotamia. <clears throat> uh, so just another example of these, um, of these types of forms. Now what's curious and, and what interests me for the topic of this conference is a very strange version of this so-called paleographic syllabary, one in which we have not examples of 
of well-formed older signs, typically from the south of Iraq, from Babylonia, but made up things, um, fantastical signs that um, don't bear any resemblance to anything we know um, um, from the earlier epigraphic record. And so one example um, is, so this is the example from Kalhu, and, and so we originally thought that this was uh, from Nineveh, but whereas this piece is definitely from Nineveh, it looks like both of these pieces are actually um, uh, from Kalhu, uh, but they simply take a, um, an older form of each sign, and then this, this deformation of the sign, uh, sometimes in, in, in patterned ways that we can anticipate, and other times it's a little clearer in the, um, in the drawing of this, in, in, in ways that we can't anticipate. So this is an example of, uh, so uh, this uh, colleague, Eva Kanchik Kirschbaum, has um, dug around in the, what we know from archeologists' recovery of material from the site of Uruk in the deep south of Iraq, uh, from the fourth millennium, late fourth millennium. We know that certain signs look certain ways, um, like over, pictured over here, and some are uh, fairly uh, recognizable, fairly have a high representational quality to them. And you can see very, with a, a casual comparison, that most of these imagined deformations of the script have nothing to do with the, um, thank you, with the, um, with the, uh, their, their earlier antecedents. So what's going on here? Um, so, um, yeah, and this is an example showing these are probably two pieces of the same object that form probably um, uh, some kind of um, series of the syllabary. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do in the time I have left is pivot to this question of, and so leave us hanging for a moment. Um, I'm not gonna wait till after the election to tell you, uh, like some people, um, but I'll leave you hanging for a brief moment um, to, to, to pivot to this question of, um, of in, inscribing bodies, and I'll, I'll hope to quickly bring it back together. Um, all right, so and that brings us to the, the domain of, uh, so away from word lists and to the domain of Mesopotamian divination, which is um, um, systematized by this period in a series of conditional statements. Um, so if P occurs, then Q may occur, whatever um, Q is. And so I'd like to give you some examples from the, the domain of physiognomies, that is, um, that is um, aspects of reading the body um, like uh, what I like to call the, the, the acts of anxious, anxious naked apes looking for, for social cues. Um, so reading facial features um, and the like um, for, for information about what's inside. And so an example of this might be um, translation of one of these texts. If a dagger is marked on this person's upper forehead, his dagger will be pre prepared for battle. If a dagger is marked on his lower forehead, a dagger will be fixed over him. So something to do with his outcome, um, the outcome in his life, uh, some future prognostication. If his forehead is like a turtle shell, he will become rich, but he will experience trouble. If his forehead has the appearance of a scorpion, he will become rich, he will die before his time or in his prime. So you can see there's, and th this is just a, a little taste of the um, variety of information, um, largely focused on, um, on the face, which is very common, in, and head in, in, in physiognomies. Um, but in our case, um, these, these texts have been organized into um, a series that we call, um, because they call it Alam Dimu, and that's what I want to, um, to focus on. Um, as, as well as um, a few of what we call tablets with signs, and that will that will bring us back to this issue of um, of deformed script script to making marks. So this um, these examples come from um, what we know of as the third tablet in this composition, this multi-tablet composition from uh, conveniently for us the Library of Asher Bain Paul, and so it, it contains entries like um, if if with respect to the um, the appearance of a man's forehead, the cuneiform sign on uh, appears, so pictured here, appears on the man's forehead, that man will experience misfortune or maybe that man is bad. And so we get a long list of examples of um, inscriptions of the body in this way um, with various different signs, sometimes grouped together, that can be organized into positive and negative signification uh, for the person so marked. Um, so one interesting facet is this um, connection to marking the human body, um, and it's not the only 
type of marking we, we see. There are examples from the, the domain of liver divination extispacy, where um, there are marks um, on the, the animal's liver when, it's, when it, it is sacrificed and inspected for um, prognostication. Um, and so we have an example if uh, this feature, um, like the cuneiform sign bod, um, then the man's wife will have illicit sexual intercourse. And so in, like with the examples um, that, um, that Jeff was giving earlier, this is clearly, so you need to know that this is a bad sign uh, from the patriarchal worldview. This may be fine from the woman's perspective, but um, from the patriarchal worldview, this is a bad sign. So what, um, what interests me, though, in this um, topic is connecting these deformed, imagined signs from an imagined past um, and the kind of reading of the body with written marks on it. And um, quite wonderfully, there is an example of precisely this. Uh, so this is a, a clay tablet from Ashurbanipal's library with, um, it'll be a little clearer in, the, um, in some of the drawings, with, um, with these deformed signs. It's a little broken in that instance, but a little clearer here um, where we get these imagined um, creations that have no, um, uh, no clear analog as far as we're concerned in the actual antiquity of the, the script practice. And so one example concerning the appearance of the man's forehead, if the cuneiform sign bad, you're getting the impression that, that bod is bad, which is a, a good one, um, appears on the man's forehead, and so it's this, this is the, the mark, um, his days will be short and something about death. And conveniently, this sign also um, has the meaning death in, um, in the cuneiform script. Now, I don't want to leave you the, with the impression that these um, imagined signs, these marks, are, um, were produced solely for the purpose of Im imagining how bodies are marked. Um, because we do have one tiny little fragment. It looks, I don't know what the, how many thousands of times larger it is than the actual piece. Um, but this is a little, a little piece from Kalhu uh, where we have some scribe trying to write something that is almost certainly a, a royal inscription, uh, royal advertising of achievements in this, um, using forms of this, um, this strange, strangely deformed script. So I'll just conclude with, um, with the idea that um, what we're looking at here are examples of, um, of drawing script, but not from a low level of, of literacy and writing ability, but rather from a very high one. Um, and that the, in fact, the instrument they're using is very ill-suited for drawing. It's very well-suited for writing, but very ill-suited for drawing. Um, and, and even this issue of scale that I mentioned before, while not uh, maybe striking at, at first glance, um, with a little closer look, is, um, is, is operative in that these are much bigger than signs one encounters um, reading normal text as opposed to simply seeing marks uh, on clay, marks in the world. Um, and so that, um, I guess, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that I, I think what is going on is an attempt to forge a deep past for the script that um, almost bypasses the, the um, heritage of Assyrian scholars in the deep south of Mesopotamia. So there's, there's something of, a, of an inferiority complex of the, um, the adaptation of a script that they know full well comes from um, the south of Iraq. Um, and so in this context, they're, they're connecting it to their own writing practices, but they're, um, they're connecting to something that in, I um, won't read this whole thing, but this idea that there are written things from before the flood uh, the, of, of biblical and Mesopot uh, fame and, and, and uh, fame in Mesopotamian literature from Gilgamesh and things like this. Um, and, that, then, and that it's that connection to deep time that um, they're, they're after when they're drawing um, these fantasies of script. Uh, thank you very much for your time.
sort of way. And that's in East Asia, certainly in Korea, also I think in China, um, there's a very popular notion that a, a woman ought to have a, a V-shaped chin. And so plastic surgeons will, there's not actually any number of advertisements, will actually have a woman's face upon which a V is imposed mm. using sort of using Western mm. sort of hyper modern image mm. in order to portray what the what the, the way that a person ought to look. Am I understanding? I mean, are these do we do we have a sense of these um, are these things uh, you know with an odd and a forehead? I'm not sure what that. I know what a V shaped chin looks right. like. I guess my question is, what does an odd marked forehead mm -hmm. look like? Or do we have any sense of, are these things that are actually being used in yeah. sort of daily practice? And how do we, how do we come to understand what the, what's being meant by a, what's to me a very obscure text? Right, yeah, it is very, it is very peculiar. The first time one encounters this is thought of, so what is, yeah, precisely what you're saying, what exactly does this look like? And I think one of the reasons this is um, so interesting, to me at least, is that it gives a sense of, of how you go from a script written in a very specific way with a very specific um, instrument and medium to something stylized that can be seen elsewhere in the world. And so for instance, one, one example that's almost imaginable is this sign for um, the date palm. Um, so this is the contemporary form of this, we call it the Gishimar sign, but that doesn't really matter for our purposes. Um, but this, you can almost imagine the furrowing of the brow. Um, um, the other issue is that in some instances, um, un for whatever reason, it was probably because it was clear to them, but not to us, they used the same combination of signs to write both the forehead and the temples. Um, and so I'm, I, so one, one thought is that what they're dealing with is the um, randomness of lining in the face. I mean, it's, it's almost easier to think of with the, with the temples as one gets um, another iteration of this. I have lots of pictures of people with the you know, crow's feet and you know, various things that you can see. And in fact, the very idea that we call marks on the face crow's feet, um, it's not writing, but it's, it's on the way. Um, yeah, so um, so I, I, I suspect that is some of the impetus, um, but it doesn't it, it doesn't certainly doesn't work in every in, in each and every instance. I, and I wonder if if a composition like this is attempting to deal with that by drawing on something else that this person is aware of that they that oh these written these graphs that we know as writing aren't just haven't always haven't looked just like that always. And in fact, we have these ancient ancient antecedents that can be used um, to, to bridge between what's familiar and then the kind of vagaries of the face, if that makes sense. But I love that parallel. That's fascinating with, I mean, especially with the, the, the modern overlays and the, and the different script and using communities. Using a foreign script. Using a foreign script even more so. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in that case, I All have right. a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> since, I'm, since I can control the time. Um, uh, so I was very, uh, as you might imagine, I was very struck by your, your discussion of the antiquarian sort of mobilization of this mm -hmm. much, better, much earlier script. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you might just articulate once a little bit more precisely, because you, you sort of draw this dialogue between writing and drawing, mm -hmm. and how that's manifested not just in the forms mm -hmm. of the writing, but also in the instruments and how people are thinking about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's plenty of parallels that point to other antiquarian traditions where systems of sort of graphic, morph you know, morphological description mm -hmm. um, figure prominently in the representation of scripts that are theoretically legible but haven't become legible yet, or in the process of becoming legible. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, do, you, do you see in that kind of documentation a sort of a tra an actual translation of the script, or is it more sort of cataloging of, of this script that hasn't been deciphered, or do you see both things happening? Um, so I so I think so th this is it. This is the corpus. So in, in, that, in that sense, we, they are. It's nice. You know, you don't often have in a historical period a corpus. You could all, maybe not a shoebox, maybe a you know, a television box for sure. Yeah. Um, so so we don't have. We know of plenty of other instances um, where where they're doing the the, the maybe more um, mundane thing of just taking an example of a script 
from a different place and a much earlier time. Um, and we know um, that they're having real encounters with these, with, with authentic instances of, these, of this script use because uh, in the course of doing renovations on big public architecture, they're digging around, finding old textual deposits, working on them, putting theirs alongside, sort of participating in antiquity in one of the many things that antiquarianism is about. Um, but this, this phenomenon is not that, and that all seem, they seem to be doing is cataloging in this strange way. And it's not, in, and what's I think significant is that, um, maybe it's a little clearer in the drawing, um, that these, maybe it's better if I do this, um, that these authentic, so, so to speak, graphs are authentic, but they're not contemporary. Those are already old, whereas, and, and, and old and foreign, so old and southerly. Um, so they're, they're um, that's the thing that they would encounter restoring a temple, say, in, um, in Babylonia somewhere, whereas these are simply being pseudo-cataloged, so to speak, created and, but created for this cataloging project. Um, if that, does that yeah. essentially yeah. pin down? Yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have a treatise that someone explains what they're doing. We just simply have their product, uh, which makes it more fun, but also more frustrating, of course. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. So now we will have a break for coffee, and we will resume in about 12 minutes.